Hey there, welcome to the Unstoppable Artist Podcast. I'm your host, Michael Outlaw, and today I'm super excited to be hanging out with you today from the Outlaw Drum Studio. So if you're ready to be inspired, wait till you hear Patrick's story. And I had no idea that it was going to be as serendipitous as it is. <laughs> there's a music studio and a guy here who appreciates all that. He's a creative mind. Um, so. Hallelujah. What's it to ya? Look away. Patrick is kind of one of the guys that really is a fighter and a warrior. Um, his wife has cancer, you know, and still be able to have a song on your heart, I feel like is, is massive. He's definitely pushing the boundaries. You can feel the emphasis that he puts on this, you know, being able that he writes his own stuff, writes his own songs. You know, it was a very pleasure to meet Patrick. We got to spend some time together on the podcast show. And I hope you enjoy this story with Patrick. I just want to apologize in advance. The audio got recorded in slow motion from some odd reason. Like it started off okay, but then some reason it started recording everything in slow motion. Hopefully you might get a kick out of this. Hey, I just want to welcome everybody to the Outlaw Process Podcast Show. And today we got a very unique, special guest, a happenstance guest. It's just all of a sudden, it's like, boom. <laughs> yes, I got my new good friend, Patrick. Welcome, Patrick. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Hey, so Patrick, tell me some of your story. Because I know like we were just talking earlier and how you are just music run through your bones. You've been songwriting for a very long time. Love music. Um, can you tell me a little bit about yourself? Yeah, well, um, where do I start? Well, first of all, I've been living in Florida for the last eight or nine years. Before that, I lived in California and Oregon and California. I started, um, I became an adult in California. (laughs) Became an adult in California. Yeah, so, uh, and I met a really influential person in my life. His name was Gus, and he was my boss, my best friend. He got me into what I do now. He helped me figure out what I do. He was your boss, too? He was my boss. He hired me with no experience to start working with these kids who had issues with behavior and who had issues with life. Um, And he must have needed somebody awfully bad or (laughs) he saw something in me, but then he was my mentor and he became my best friend. He taught me how to play guitar and I started uh, walking to his house every Thursday night with a guitar and a new song. And uh, that's what kind of shaped my adulthood, my relationship with Gus and my relationship with my wife, Marie, those two things kind of got me to where I am. And then, um, I've traveled the world and used Airbnb a lot. So Mm. I've ended up in some really interesting places. And then I decided on Sunday, I was going to do an escape. I was going to run away from my home in Jacksonville, Florida. (laughs) And I picked this place just because it looked like a, a cabin in the woods which is what I was looking for, which it is. And I had no idea that it was going to be as serendipitous as it is. <laughs> it, there's a music studio and a guy here who appreciates all that and a creative mind. Um, so that's how I ended up right here right now. There's a lot in between there. Yeah, you messaged me and you was like, I'm going to bring my guitar. I was like, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and then um, this guitar right here is kind of special too. And this ain't just any old guitar guitar is it this is a beautiful taylor guitar um and this belonged to my best friend the gus the one i just was just talking about he um he played this guitar every every thursday night when i went to his house he was playing this guitar and he also had another guitar which was a a pretty rare and a and a pretty pricey uh refurbished 1940s martin Mm. a solid mahogany no frills but just uh, the most amazing guitar I ever played. So I always played his Martin, and he always played this Taylor. Um, and Gus got sick a few years back, and uh, when he was he was getting close to the end, he told me uh, I gave that Martin to my niece, and I almost swallowed my teeth, and then I tried not to look disappointed. Um, he said, "Don't worry, don't worry. This is the right thing to do." And then after he passed away, and I was at his house. And I was helping his wife plan a service and reminiscing about all the years we spent together. She said, oh, by the way, Gus wanted you to have the tailor. 
not the Martin. I said, really? And he, she said, yeah, because the Martin is the one that he put all his heart and soul. He wasn't just putting his fingers on it. He was putting his whole his whole existence in it. And, yeah, man. And playing all those songs that we wrote and played together, um, they came out of here. So it's it's a prized possession. I wasn't sure if I... That thing sounds clean. <laughs> and I wasn't sure if I should take it. I felt, <laughs> I felt weird about it because he was an amazing guitar player, too. I'm a... Um, moderately talented guitar player i can play chords to write songs with but <laughs> gus was a natural it was like the, one of the languages he spoke was uh music yeah you, you can you can tell that that but that's that's very special man i was so glad and that thing's mic'd up really crazy we we played about four or five songs earlier and this thing was just so clean this man say tell me a little bit about some of these songs that we that, that we've recorded earlier okay because um, i know i didn't realize how like that you're a fantastic songwriter i mean some of the song this the lyrics i mean bro well i, I appreciate that <laughs> i'm glad you enjoyed them yeah um one song I that, that one i was telling michael about what I was what i was telling you about is um called dixieland and i had had these experiences growing up in north carolina and going to high school in winston-salem north carolina in the late 70s so i was meeting a lot of people that portrayed themselves as one way on sunday morning and then behind the doors of their house they portrayed themselves another way and it was confusing to me and it was basically this there's this this, there was an overtone of racism that I, I wasn't sure was had existed. I mean, I heard my father say some pretty um, questionable things, but <laughs> but I was seeing it in, in, in real life. And, and so those were stored away somewhere in my brain. And then when my, my wife and I went f from California to Florida, we were driving down the road in, in North Fort Myers, Florida, and I, we had California license plates on our... Um, Chevy and this guy pulled up next to us and I don't know if I'd cut him off or he just didn't like the look of me or he did definitely didn't like the California license plate <laughs> and he signaled roll down your window and so my wife obligingly rolled down the window and he leaned in there and he said hey you're not in California anymore you're in Dixieland and then he called us some name that described things you do and then um, <laughs> my wife was like excuse me <laughs> Um, and so then I started to explain to her like the connotation of Dixieland and the history of the American South and um, the history of America and where Dixieland came from. Um, and then when I was doing that, it just seemed like the perfect title for the song about going to high school in Winston-Salem, North Carolina in the 70s. So that song is called Dixieland and it's about a mixed race couple experiencing what they experienced just trying they were just minding their own business and just dating in high school like a lot of people do but it was a problem for others yeah oh my gosh that's crazy but it 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 it, it just fell, she's not fell from out. around here she's she was born and raised in in London England so um yeah her take on America is is refreshing and is also some things that you and I know because we've that's where we've lived and that's where we've grown up and that's where we've gone to school so um, some of these things for her are, are new things like she she was listening to a Tim McGraw song and said she called me by my last name funnily she says Gundy what, what's a rag top <laughs> what's a rag top uh, it's a convertible car <laughs> and they're lies man <laughs> but there's a lot of things when spending time with her in England too just the way that we use language here and there is just mostly the same but also different um, so yeah that was uh, that was Dixieland um, I also wrote a song that I think we we played in there um, called Penny in Your Pocket mm -hmm. and that just grew, I think, from a con. It's more of an intimate song. Yeah. That, that is a definitely more a personal song, and it was based on the thought, like, would, it was, I wrote it quite a ways back. Sorry, my compression. But, but it didn't be, um, didn't, didn't really become pertinent until the right occasion. It's just a song about what happens when you die, and if, and it's how you can reassure your loved ones, I guess. Yeah. Um, but it became meaningful because we played it at Gus's mom's funeral mm -hmm. and then 
just recently at Gus's funeral. So that song holds a special place for me. But um, that one, uh, but I wrote it 20 years ago. And it just was like, I guess I, I had something in my brain that was telling me to write that. What else did we... We did the other one uh, called... Um, what was that? Um, oh, I, I wrote one about living in San Diego. San Diego, yeah. Because my wife and I have been spending a lot of time apart. And some days I just reminisce. And San Diego had some very specific... It was kind of like this wonderful time um, where we were older. Neither one of us was on our first relationship, but we were... Um, definitely in love and, and definitely just having a great time and enjoying life yeah. and San Diego lends itself to that and the neighborhood where we lived had all this vivid imagery with um, the little Mexican restaurant on the corner and the porch that we had where we would sit at night but the one thing that kept coming back was these jets because the airport in San Diego is right downtown so every five minutes the jets would fly over and there was a little corner of um, Balboa Park that we could that we could walk to from our house we could lay on our backs and the jets were it was like you could touch them um so that just led to another song and then it's called passenger jets and it's just a collection of imagery and and jets are a pretty neutral image but they can uh they can they can take you far away from a loved one or they can take you to a loved one um and like like the tide if you're living in a city the jets just keep on coming and just like if you're living by the ocean you can always count on the waves keep on yeah. coming too that's, 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 that's pretty to look at so tell me about like some of your songwriting process you think it's a lot has to do with like you have to be feeling a song before you can just start writing a song don't you don't you have to sure. kind of have that like how do you know when you got a song right here in the, in the works like okay. is it start from like a phrase or that's a good question because it's not always the same, but a lot of times it is. It's a phrase, I'll be, I will think, or a title. Um, ooh, that'd be a good title, or that's a good phrase, or it sounds. Or sometimes it'll be something that has more than one meaning, and that always makes for a good phrase in a song or a title for a song. Um, and sometimes you just wake up with a thought in your head, and you're like, uh, you'll dream about it or you'll wake up thinking about something or you'll some, wake up with a song on your head yeah like, just, yeah it happens or sometimes you'll just see something walking down the street and then it'll trigger something else and it's kind of uh, very cool like if you just listen to people sometimes they'll tell you the song lyrics because you listen to somebody or you have somebody say something or some kind of phrase that's kind of caught naturally and then you're just like there it is and it's yeah. just like a you know um, could, could you know? But do you, do you normally work on songs like by yourself? Yes, I'm, I've I've listened to a lot of people talk about songwriting, and like in Nashville these days, it's definitely people write them in pairs or groups. They write them together, and then they finish each other's songs. Or, but I've never really done that. I've always um, sat by myself and written songs and. Um, I've never had collaborators like with my buddy Gus I would bring a song to his house and it would have the chord progressions and the lyrics and the verses and the chorus and he could put some notes in there I mean so we collaborated in that regard but uh he put like some like a like almost like a lead to it yeah he was the lead player on on a lot of the songs we recorded a few and so he made me give him co-write credit because of that. But, <laughs> <laughs> but and that's a, a little bit of lead guitar don't make you wrote the song. <laughs> but he did things I couldn't do, so he made them. He definitely yeah, made them better. I feel he, that. he he definitely polished the rock. I would bring a rock and he would polish it up, and then um, sometimes we would after listening to him play, it might change a little bit of how I some of the phrases mm -hmm. in the song too. How many songs do you have? Like how many songs have you wrote? I bet you you've got a, got a few, uh -huh. huh? More than a couple hundred. <laughs> yeah. I uh, mean, you was putting them songs out left right. When we set up over there, it was just like, boom, boom, boom. <laughs> that boom, was just the boom. top. But uh, my philosophy with songwriting is write them all, right? And some of them, some of them you don't even really want to keep or have anybody else hear them. But if you don't write them all, you might miss something that you thought wasn't going to be very. I've written some songs 
and thought they were okay and then played them for people and they were like wow that's that's a great song so my philosophy is write them all <laughs> so do you ever like my sometimes i'll write a song and then i'll go back and listen to it the next day and i'm like this is the cheesiest song i've ever heard like is it good to like take a break and come back to listen to it again? Like once you're kind of out of it and then kind of coming in with fresh ears, you do that? I do do that. That's, that does help because sometimes you're inside of the song mm-hmm. so much that you, you forget actually how it sounds or you might. Almost kind of you can't see the trees because you're in the forest. Yeah, exactly. It's like you're worried about the notes and all that kind of stuff versus how does it look from a distance? But you know. then again, I've also had songs where I just wrote it in 20 minutes and then never changed a, a thing about it, and those could be good songs. You said those are normally the best ones, the ones you write real fast and just like maybe come I mean, together real easy? Sometimes. And then there's other songs where I thought I was writing two separate songs, and one just ended up being the chorus to a verse, and they might not have seemed like they were connected, but then on some level they must have been because it it fit together. Yeah. But I don't know. I'm a... I'm an amateur songwriter, so I'm not an expert on the process. I'm not even an expert on me, but um, <laughs> it's for me, it, it is one of the things that I do that makes me feel relaxed because behaviorally speaking, you cannot play guitar, try to remember the words and the chord progressions and sing and then be stressed. It's incompatible with yeah. stress. So. For me, that's it is creative and it, it helps me put thing, thoughts together and it, and it it's relaxing. It's inherently relaxing. Yeah, I have a hard time remembering the lyrics. Every time I, I mean, I, I was noticing you, you was just spitting your lyrics off like crazy. You had them lyrics down. Did you like study to remember them or you just like as <laughs> soon as you write them down, you remember them? No, no, no. Um, sometimes I do, but some of those songs <laughs> that I played today, I've probably played them a hundred times. So, um, it's you were ready. You didn't have to stay. You had no notebook in there. You was just like <laughs> popping them off. I was like, Heck, I can't even write, remember my own song lyrics. I got to write them down. I, and I get it because I don't just don't practice so much, you know, because I feel like, you know, that's the one thing that I'm doing, you know, that I really don't want to put like a dollar. I don't want to try to make money on my music. You know, I like that stuff to kind of come naturally. I feel like when you try to, there's enough of that out there, people trying to yeah. make a living doing that, but. You know, connecting and being able to rely that message into a, a musical phrase is is very special, very special. And um, yeah, super blessed to have you come out here, man. What'd you think about the studio, man? Uh, I'm telling you, I'm very impressed with it because, like I said, I was coming out here to get out of the city, take a break from work, turn off my work email, and just see stars instead of cars Mm. and just see what I like to see places I haven't been before so when I came here I was like that looks like a comfortable spot looks like um, nice people (laughs) and then I show up and there's a music studio there's a drum Uh, I knew you made drums I read that on the um, Airbnb uh, page but all of a sudden I'm in a studio that has really nice equipment I was very impressed I I started strumming and singing a song I've sung a, a hundred times and it sounded really nice with the uh, the way you were recording it, so I'm very impressed with the studio. That <laughs> I would come back to do that. Heck yeah, man! That was really cool going through that right there. And you know, I just saw that. Saw you had an amazing story, man. I wanted to capture that because, yeah. you know, if you can go back and change anything, maybe would you go back and change anything as far as with your musical status that you are right now? Would you do if, anything different? If I was gonna go back, which I don't think is a good practice to to think too much about that. (laughs) But sometimes I wish, and sometimes I still think I should, uh, just try to learn more skills with my right hand so I can do some strums and finger picks Mm. and do some things that um, would embellish the songs. Because I feel like I I learned just enough to get fluent so I could do express what I wanted to express and then I relied on my friends. Um, so if I was going to go back, that's probably what I'd do. Just learn a little more um, guitar skills. It's mm-hmm. not too late. I still practice right. learning languages at this yeah. advanced age that I'm at. So elderly people could still learn. I feel like it's like you, it's like a lot of muscle memory happening here too. Yeah. Like you, without that muscle memory, just getting doing it, not even thinking about it, you know. But I see some people who play guitar, and um, and I was like, dang, I wish I could just do that little bit right there because mm-hmm. that would add something to what I'm trying to say or you know trying to yeah. communicate 
Yeah, that's that's pretty cool, man. But I'm trying to move forward. I can't, and it doesn't pay to go back, right? Like I, I'll write songs about things that have already happened, but they're for now. You yeah. know, they're for now, and to remember things a certain way, and to feel a certain way, or to help people feel a certain way. So you don't necessarily like play it with a group of people. You don't. Have, you don't never play with a band or anything like that. I don't have a band. No. Um, I've always thought that might be fun. And when uh, when I played with Gus, we 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 were a duo. You know, we we went and played played at bars or played in the uh, art show at the park or something like that but no I've never um, played with a band I think that'd be fun though and yeah. I love the I love the like I listen to some bands and the way that they can put their instrumentation together and the way that they can all like be on the same page at the same time yeah the best bands like it's that's amazing to me and that's one of the reasons I like listening to music is to hear the bands but like guys what you i'm trying to think of a band i was listening to earlier that just impressed me because they were all on the same page and it was just you could tell the guy who wrote the song was singing it and it, you could tell he wrote it from a certain point of view but all of a sudden this guy comes in with a fiddle and then there's a guy playing a bass and and it just it just kept building on itself and it made made the song better so yeah man that's good stuff man good stuff yeah well Patrick, man, I appreciate you being here, man. You got anything you want to say? Anything else you want to say, man? What no. about to, for the love of music? <laughs> well, I just want to say thank you. As I, I feel very fortunate to have ended up in this spot. Sometimes those things happen for a reason. Um, so I feel fortunate. Um, just met just met your mom. Now I've spent some time with you. I'd like to do some more music. It's not I'm not that far away. And also just that, uh, like, it doesn't matter at this point in the world where you go to church. Yeah. And it doesn't matter who you voted for last Tuesday, and it doesn't matter um, what what color your cousin is. Like we're all we're all here together, and and the most important thing is just to be kind to people. Yeah. It doesn't take any more effort, or it doesn't cost anything. And so if we could just all figure that part out, we can disagree in a kind way and love each other through it all. I think we'd all I think we'd be in a better place. Yeah. Life is so good, man. We got so much to be thankful for right now. And that's like, you think about all earthly problems that we have, you know, I got problems. We don't have any problems. We don't have problems. I mean, our heart is still beating. Yep. Um, that's a good thing. Because if it wasn't. <laughs> yeah. No, I'm grateful for it. I'm grateful every day. Whatever yeah. whatever the hard things are, we get through them and, and then we wake up and there it is like today i woke up and the, the sky was this certain color blue that i mm. don't see where i am and it was this southwest georgia <laughs> blue sky and you got to run around too huh and i got to go see a few things Check out some cotton fields and then i went far enough to see some uh canyon uh Providence, Providence Canyon? Canyon. Yeah, that's a big. People, a lot of people come here to stay just to just see that Providence Canyon. It was. It was. Did pretty you, you went. You got close enough to see that. Yeah. Oh, you went way over there. Well, well you know, I, I'm here. Like, yeah. I you think didn't was, walk down there. You didn't walk. We stayed on the top. Mm. <laughs> I, had, I had my dog, so uh, we were good. Just walking the rim and taking it in and just seeing what's yeah. out. Like, it's a beautiful world. It is a beautiful world, man. We got so much to be thankful for and. I appreciate you doing what you're doing, man, and pushing peace. And I just knew that, you know, we had a good vibe when I saw you. I was like, yeah. Cool. Yeah, man. Thanks a lot. Thank you, bro. Appreciate you being here. My pleasure. Yes. Jimmy was the point guard, had the ball upon the string. Sonia, she was popular and she was good at everything when they started going out some folks began to talk you see Sonia's skin was cinnamon and Jim was white as chalk now they were just two kids with crushes they weren't meaning any harm but at a playoff game when Jimmy came Sonia on his arm Some old boys called out from a pickup truck Hey, you're a traitor to your race And in the parking lot while Sonia watched They pounded Jimmy's face And they said, hallelujah What's it to ya? 
look away Don't you understand Hallelujah What's it to ya They look away This is Dixie Land Paper said Jim was a hero A real hometown boy makes good When he got that scholarship to Duke Like we all knew he would but Sonia, she stayed home She went to school and she worked part time You know the whole town cheered when Jim appeared With his new girl at Christmas time Hallelujah, what's it to ya? A look away, don't you understand? Hallelujah, what's it to ya? They look away, this is Dixie Fan. They look away. This is Dixie Land. And way down south in the land of cotton. Old times there, they're not forgotten. Look away, look away, look away. This is Dixie Land. We made all our promises and we shed all our sins. We were flying down that county road where the river run begins. The song came on the radio one we heard a thousand times. You were shouting out the lyrics. I kept a car between the lines and we were young but not that young we were getting older and it felt like we were somewhere in between that place where the world gets hard and colder in a place where you're still young enough to dream With the water all around us On a big rock in the flat I kissed your neck and shoulders And the small part of your back The subtle sun was sliding slow in to the western sky for a moment there we captured time and then we felt it rushing by cause we were young but not that young we were getting older and it felt like we were somewhere in between that place where it's hard and cold her in a place where you're still young enough to dream. Ten good years that old 
old song on the radio like a shotgun hitting my ears we were right back in that pony hack on a two-lane road through time and with everything i learned since then i'm glad to know that i'm young but not that young i'm getting older and it feels like i somewhere in between that place where the world gets hard and colder and a place where you're still young enough to dream yeah there's a place where you're still young enough to dream Young enough